welcome. This is our first lecture of our Spring Ahead program for the uh, at the HNCT and Art Center College of Design. I'm Gloria Kondrup and I'm the executive director of the Hoffman Smokin Center for Typography. And I want to thank everyone for attending. I have some two very special guests today, and I'll introduce them. Uh, so first, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce Lynn Yoon, who is our guest lecturer, and Roy Tatum, who is our guest moderator, um, because Lynn is going to talk about, of course, many areas of design and typography that I am familiar with, but of course she's going to talk a lot about areas of typography and technology and computational typography that Roy is far more experienced. So as an introduction, I want to say that Lynn was a, is a New York City-based type designer, educator, and technologist. I like that term. You specialize in typography, hand lettering, and calligraphy. You currently teach, I believe, at, at Type and Cooper and Parsons School of Design. And thank you for being here. I know finals would just happen. You are the recipient of the A. Senders Award from Type Directors Club such a luminary, which honors designers under the age of 35 Hmm. who show remarkable achievement in typography, type design, and lettering. Uh, you're also featured, I know, in print magazine and as one of the top 10 most talented female creatives living and breathing letters today. And Roy, uh, Roy is a faculty member at Art Center College of Design, where he teaches generative type and generative design, and a partner at Quarter, a product, a product studio based both in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, that's focused on building software, hardware, brands, and ventures for um, uh, partners exploring new territory in design and technology. Roy also co-founded and serves as creative director at Numbers, a design studio specializing in type design, identity design, and illustration projects. So, um, Lynn, if you'd like to share your screen, be my guest. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gloria. Very excited to be here. All right. Oh, so, I'm so happy um, you're here. <laughs> All right. So Both of you. I'm very excited. All right. Um, so I'll get started. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Lynn. Um, I mean, thanks again to Gloria for giving me such a great introduction. I'm very excited to chat with Roy later on too. And today I'm going to talk about the concept of glyphs Glyphsian space, and we'll get into the weeds in just a little bit. But uh, but first of all, I feel like it's only um, uh, proper that I give you some kind of idea of my background. So I am currently a type designer and educator in New York City, but my background has been in slightly different places um, to where I am now. So when I was younger, I was a graphic designer. Um, I went to school here in New York City for uh, graphic design, and then afterwards I decided to pursue type design, and so I went to the Type of Cooper um, program for type de typeface design, and so from there I slowly trickled into being a full-time type designer at Monotype, and eventually I went to NYU's ITP uh, master's program, which teaches art and technology, and now I'm dabbling in all these fields uh, with an emphasis on technology, specifically um, generative typography at this point. But what I'm here to talk about with you today is the concept of the Glyphsian space. So last summer I was commissioned by Luke Prouse from the NAN Foundry to write a piece for them. And Luke graciously let me have free reign on uh, the exact topic that I was going to write. So I wrote about this idea that had been simmering in my mind for a little bit. Um, I think that I, the concept of generative typography, uh, digital typography, that is something beyond just laying out digital fonts um, in a software program, it, like that concept hasn't been around for too long in its current form. But I was a little bit lost because as with anything that doesn't have a very deep history, um, sometimes it's hard to grasp concepts if you don't have a solid framework in mind. So this is an ongoing process, but I wanted to uh, let you in in my headspace a little bit, so to speak. But before I go diving into whatever Glyphsian space is, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, my thoughts on what 
uh, forms the, the backbone, the framework uh, for this concept. So let's think about technology. And someone once told me that technology people think about it vaguely as something that was invented after they are born. And I think that's, I think that's a little accurate. Um, but if we say like, what, what is the meaning um, as uh, in the dictionary, uh, it's the, it's a science of craft. So it can really be anything that was uh, developed and crafted. So, I mean, people, people are always saying that fire is the original in technology and invention, but let's think about um, what we love and all are here for, which is letter forms, right? And when we think about letters, we tend to take them for granted because I'm sure every morning you wake up, you probably look at the clock, look at your phone, uh, whatever you're doing, looking at a menu uh, at the coffee shop, you're looking at type and letters. And so we tend to take them for granted. Um, and, even, and even the language that you're using, like we're obviously using English to converse, but we are probably even taking that for granted. And we think about this as technology. Um, we can think about this as a system that someone invented. So like some people long ago said, if I say hello, that is going to be encoded in H-E-L-L-O, like these shapes. Um, and then so these shapes are encoded and we agree that this is what they sound like. So even when we're not together, if I write this and send it to you, you can decode it back in your head. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm like skipping over like a whole genre <laughs> of, uh, of study here. But uh, let's think about this as a system um, where there is spoken language or written language and they're broken down into units. And the smallest form we could say is a glyph or a letter, right? Like, of course we can like, we can divide them down to its atoms. But if we think about the structural component of it as a type designer, um, I tend to think about them like this. So we see this and I'm, and as a small example, I'm taking just the Roman shaped letter, uh, lowercase letters here, um, we can think about like the A through Z. And although we think about the A through Z as a system, there is another modular system within it. Meaning that if I were to break this um, system down into shapes that look like the O and shapes that look like the N, we can see that these shapes are repeated over and over again. Um, and of course, there's always like some outlier, such as the letter S, of course, uh, which is only um, organically evolving as we are all humans and we tend to do little odds and bits and things that get uh, picked up over time. But we can see that these are definitely um, a system that has been made. And of course, like I'm using technology and systems and all these words in a very broad, <laughs> broad, uh, you know, context. But let's think about the ways that technology has evolved to show typefaces. So like, like now with the concept of letter form being a technology out of the way, let's think about like uh, what we usually think about as technology, like computers, like TV, like all these things. Um, now the way that type has been produced has been very, very different over time. Um, if you think about the Gutenberg Bible, we can assume that there were uh, these little bits of metal type that people uh, in rooms painstakingly made and they were all assembled into a certain, you know, uh, mach printing machinery and then they were all printed. And so like the piece, little piece of metal type that someone carved was going to be the direct shape that was imprinted on the paper uh, versus, you know, like over time, like we have all these technologies um, uh, boiling, you know, like, changing the way that we think about type. And instead of it being a physical form, we now know that uh, typefaces are most commonly encountered in the form of a digital file. Um, so we can't, we, we can't feel them anymore. We can't really pick them out of um, a cabinet, right? Like if you've ever done like printing, uh, especially letterpress, like you know that there is a certain quality to a metal uh, type that you can feel, uh, but it gets to be very abstract when it gets to um, digital typefaces, right? And it seems a little bit like a black box. It seems like a mystery. And um, I think it. I think a lot of people forget that at the end of the day, font files are still files that you can open up and look at. Um, and and so I think it's important to not think about digital files as something that is just somehow magically getting exported out of 
uh, Robofont or Glyphs or, you know, Photoshop or whatever, but um, something that someone made, right? Like at the end of the day, a program, any sort of software is still at the end of the day, something that someone made. Um, and so if we can think about digital typefaces in that way, I think we can get through that barrier of a digital font file being something that we can't touch or we can't mess with. Um, and I'll get I'll get to those concepts in a little bit. But uh, let's think about typefaces um, in uh, typeface files in the simplest way possible, which is almost like a a recipe or like an instructional manual from ikea or something um so if you have ever opened up a font file you'll just see a lot of coordinates in there and you might think like what is all this mumbo jumbo nonsense but actually the concept is very very uh simple it basically tells the machine where it should plot the first point and then where the second point is and where the third point is and so on and so forth and then uh that way the machine knows how to draw a letter. So if we take this example of a, uh, it, like an A that is like an upside down V plus a bar, um, it's actually two shapes. And what is happening in the split of a second when we type in an A on our keyboard is that the machine goes like, okay, so I should go from coordinate one through the last one, um, draw that shape. And then it's telling me to draw a bar. So it's, I'm going to go to points one, two, three, four, and then bam, like it shows that outline. Um, and so it's actually not that different from reading a manual um, that someone once upon a time made, such as a type designer. And I know I've been talking a lot about technology and uh, t letter forms as something that was invented for practical, functional reasons. But how about when letter forms are used for uh, something that isn't so uh, practical or functional? What about letter forms being used um, as a medium or concept for creative purposes, a personal expression? Um, and this concept has been around for a long time, and this is a big genre, but just to go over a few that might be of interest to you, um, there's a category of writing that is called acebic writing. Um, and this is a category of writing that doesn't have a specific script attached to it. Um, it's it's unreadable um, writing is if you can if you can um, allow me to say that. So this is the Voynich manuscript, which is one of the oldest, uh, if not the oldest example of it. And this is an unknown writing system. And for the longest time, um, it was studied by a lot of cryptographers, uh, including American and British codebreakers from World War One and II, um, and it has never been deciphered. And at this point, people are now skip uh, you know, speculating that this is just someone somewhere in the 15th century that just decided to write something that looked like writing, but it wasn't actually writing, right? So, like, this is a concept um, where there is something akin to writing, but is not for communicative purposes, right? Like no one can read this, but we can see that there is this idea of letter form because we're used to this idea of a certain pattern, a certain texture, a certain modularity that brings about the feeling of letter forms. And uh, here I skip to typewriter art. And type, uh, typewriter art is a great example um, for many generative classes because it can be considered one of the earliest machine-made art forms. And so you can see that uh, this butterfly is made out of everything that can be typed out on a typewriter. Um, and these O's and X's that I've enlarged on the right side of the screen, uh, they're not really being used for O's or X's or any, you know, any, any glyph uh, meaning um, or any, you know, any sound meaning, but uh, we can totally see it's being used to very, very great effect for the purposes of texture and rhythm um, and for artistic expression. And um, concrete poetry is uh, another um, topic that is very, very close to my heart. And I suppose it's it's probably the same for many typographers out there. Um, and here is Mary Ellen Salt, uh, who was an important American concrete poet. And uh, these weren't made by computers, like they were all like composed, but you can totally see um, the idea of letter forms being used for certain kinds of aesthetic purposes that aren't just for 
uh, the glyph face value. And this is where the personal artistic creative expression that I'm talking about comes from. Um, and, uh, and here we see uh, Hans-Jörg Mayer, uh, who had a series of publication called Futura, which was surprisingly uh, made with Futura, uh, the typeface. And uh, th this is just one in a series, I think it was like 11 or 14 series of Futura, all named Futura 1, Futura 2, and so forth, um, so on and so forth. But uh, it's all utilizing textura, um, textures, natural, well, <laughs> texture and shape and form. Um, and there is a certain quality that comes through in the series because it's only using one typeface. And now um, I guess the point that I'm trying to get across is that like letter forms, even when they're not being used for pure readability, um, there is a very strong aesthetical uh, quality to it that people are gravitated towards. Um, and here is a slightly different example. Um, and, of, and of course, like concrete poetry and all these things are not just limited to the Latin using world. Um, this is an example that I love, love, love um, from, from Sue Bing, Book from the Sky. And uh, to, to those, uh, including myself who can't read Chinese, it might seem like Chinese, but it's, but it's not. It's like pseudo Chinese, uh, meaning that the, um, I, I suppose like most people would know that Chinese, um, uh, characters are made out of like smaller chunks of characters, right? Like they're like composed in a way, um, usually in this like square format, but uh, there are certain combinations that would never exist, right? Like there's about like maybe 20,000 characters in use. And if you can imagine all the possible combinations, there are many combinations that are never used. Um, and so like all these letters that you're seeing here are characters that don't actually exist, but they look like they might exist uh, because they're made out of the same, um, I guess like rhythm and nature of something that might exist. Right. And so like these were all hand carved uh, 4000 wood blocks. And I can I haven't seen this in person, but I can imagine it be like really, really touching to see something um, like this. Uh, I mean, it's it's purposefully undis done this this fire. <laughs> I can't pronounce things today, but, you know, it's like this thing that you feel like you could read, but you can't. Um, and um, <laughs> Mirtha Dermisachi um, takes us one step further. So uh, Mirtha Dermisachi was an um, Argentine artist who uh, wrote or drew, uh, depending on who you ask, I suppose, like a lot of these compositions. And this is a series where uh, I think she took newspaper um, columns and then redrew them to make it seem like they were words, uh, paragraphs composed in the format of a newspaper, but you can't read any of it. Um, now, like I think Martha Dermisachi never publicly said it, it had any political context, but a lot of people uh, do speculate that it might have been um, because this was made in the, the late 60s and um, early 70s when a lot of artists were creating work related to um, uh, you know, political freedom and speech. And uh, uh, let's, um, I'm going to jump quite a few decades and come over into contemporary um, examples. Now we have the computer as a medium. And of course, that has changed a lot of the ways that these uh, personal expressions uh, might take form. But um, the core of it, I think, feels, still feels the same. So here is like the Nintendo logo that uh, that someone just made different glitch versions out of it. And although um, although we know like none of, some of these look nothing like the Nintendo logo, we can totally see the aesthetic that comes across, like the idea of this, uh, this glitch aesthetic forming this texture that we can some, in some way, somehow like kind of acknowledge as uh, repetitive modular forms that we recognize in, uh, you know, just, typography in general, like just coming through. And of course, like there's this whole genre of the ASCII art uh, that I'm skipping over, but um, there are a lot of beautiful examples such as this, where uh, people have taken type, um, in this instance, it's all these like star symbols 
that uh, we were able, we are now able to make because uh, digital type doesn't consume uh, physical materials and as much uh, capital as it used to, right? Like, so there's a lot of these like um, extra, like symbols out there that people are using in order to um, create uh, beautiful pieces of art. I, I want to call, call them pieces of art. Um, these are from one of my favorite artists, uh, Everest Pipkin. It's a, it's a Twitter bot, you should subscribe if you're on Twitter. <laughs> And uh, as a little as a, another detour before I start talking about the Glyphsian space, I, I just want to say that I don't particularly consider programming and coding to be like some kind of like new genre that has fallen from the sky. Um, to me, it always feels like it's something uh, that is in my toolbox of expressions uh, and ways to make letter forms. Like for instance, like when I wanted to go make uh, Dion signs, I, I needed to learn how to use flame and glass and all these materials. Um, you, can, you can see my nerdy face um, up on the corner. And then when I really wanted to make letters out of wood, I needed to go take a class um, in the art of wood carving and learn how to do it, learn how to sharpen my knife, um, how to chisel uh, little teeny tiny pieces of wood, how to print it. Um, and when I wanted to make uh, a, a lamp that had letter forms on it, I needed to go uh, to a wood uh, woodworking workshop, like see um, see how I could make the the legs, and then learn how to make a laser cutting, how to use a letter, laser cutting machine in order to make this lamp. Um, and also, I learned how to wire things. Right, like these are all different tools. Um, and even when it comes to more um, tools that we might be more familiar with, such as like paint and paintbrush. Um, I feel like almost everyone that has ever gone through like primary school would know uh, the experience of using these tools. Uh, there is a slightly different way to use each tool depending on how you're using it and the way you're using it, right? So here's an example of me painting teeny, 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 tiny little um, letters. So here you can see me on the top right with like jeweler's glasses because I, I just couldn't see with my regular eyes anymore, although my, my eyesight is perfectly fine. Um, and then of course, like I needed to use like a different tool, like projectors and like, you know, like cameras from the back of the room when I was painting this like giant mural because I also couldn't see what I was drawing for a different reason, right? Like I was too close as opposed to being, um, you know, too far. Um, and then like, I also needed to use different paintbrushes and use different paint because it was a different surface. Uh, but at the end of the day, like uh, for something like this, like to me, conceptually painting on a mural feels conceptually very similar, if not the same as painting on um, like a smooth sheet of watercolor paper. So um, what I'm trying to say is that like when I came to my recent obsession of programming and code, it didn't feel that different to me um, than like just like trying to have another tool in the toolbox, um, uh, you know, um, and I think I was a little bit overwhelmed when I went into the world of programming and code because unlike many different uh, obsessions that I've had before, <laughs> there wasn't a clear framework for it. Like for instance, when I went into calligraphy, there had already been like many centuries worth of historical documents, articles, essays that I could read. And I knew what people called what, like there is this thing called like the, you know, like letter categories, right? Like this is a serif, this is a sans serif, but like there's, there's, not, there's nothing like that for digital, digital um, areas of typography just yet. Right, or like not that much at the very least. Um, and while I was just reading a lot of things to uh, wrap my head around this, I came across this concept of the Hertzian space. Um, it's coined by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Ravi. Like here is a great book. Um, I think it's in like chapter six, um, still in print uh, from uh, the MIT press. Um, so the Hertzian space refers to the hidden electromagnetic environment generated by electronic devices. Now, like, what, is, what does that even mean, electromagnetic environment? Um, so it basically means everything that is generated uh, that gives off an electromagnetic field. So like that could be like a radio station, that could be your phone, that could be, um, you know, visible light, right? Visible light gave, gives off um electromagnetic fields. And so it just like is like this way of like 
you know, just having a term that encompasses these things that the author wanted to talk about. Um, and I know like these, this kind of seems eth uh, ethereal and maybe like not so re relatable, but like, I'm like a type A person who definitely needs a way to wrap um, a head around like a concept in order for me to dig inside it. Like I try to give myself, this is a very designer way of thinking I realize, um, like when I'm stuck with this vast amount of possibilities. I want to have some kind of framework so I have something to grab onto um, as I go into the unknown, uh, so, to, so to speak. And so um, I'm, I'm going back to this idea of the Glyphsian space. And so when I was setting out to write this uh, essay, I was thinking about what really draws me into exploring digital forms. And then it struck me that um, I just love systems. <laughs> um, I love exploring systems um, to be more, more specific. And so like as a graphic designer, I learned that like typefaces were a cohesive visual system, right? Like in like typography one-on-one, we learn that Baskerville looks trustworthy because it has serifs and it's like rounded, like the proportions are a certain way, um, but like sans serifs give off a certain vibe because, you know, like, because all of it looks a certain way or like there's like some kind of cohesive visual system there. Um, and so like, I knew that type, uh, you know, encompass some kind of visual system. Um, and then when I went into type design, I learned that there is a modular system within it. Like, it's not just like the feeling of everything being cohesive. There's actually shapes that are being repeated throughout. Like for instance, like the crossbar of an E, uh, uh, like the crossbar of an uppercase E sh has some relationship to the crossbar of an uppercase F. Um, it, I mean, it, sh it probably isn't exactly the same, but it should look similar, right? Like serif should look similar. There's probably some kind of like um, shapes that are repeating like a, up like a one letter shouldn't look completely different from another, right? Like the A, the P, the D, the P, the Q, they should all look similar, right? Um, anyway, so like I noticed that there was a modular system. And then I was kind of happy with that knowledge until I became a programmer. Um, uh, type design uh, gets you into this like rabbit hole, I suppose. And then I realized that when I opened up um, font files and then like started to do sort of like try to do something with it in programming languages, I realized that there's an instructional system inside uh, this modular system, right? Like there is a system that I was talking about earlier, like that is like, go from this node to that node. And then like, um, if you're used to using like open type features or whatever, like it's like, well, if this letter is next to this other letter, we should make them closer or further or swap it out with a different letter. Like there's like some kind of instruction in there, you know, like a little Lego kit. Um, and this was very, very interesting to me because that just means like, it's like this like Russian doll nesting system that like you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into kind of like the, um, the Eames video where it's like the power of 10 and someone's just like on a picnic blanket and all of a sudden like you just like keep going into like the, the hand and then there's like these like molecules and there, there's atoms and things, right? Um, and so I, it, trying to get into what this exactly was, I started uh, writing this essay um, that it was published last summer. I think, I don't know if I mentioned that before, but anyway, um, so for, for me, it seemed like every glyph, even if it was just like one simple glyph, um, let's say like an O, um, it seems simple and it maybe just just with a passing eye, maybe just looks like two circular shapes over overlapping one another, but there's actually a big world within that, right? Like, so for example, for those of you familiar with uh, drawing digital shapes with like pen tools or something, you can probably kind of imagine that like, okay, like there's probably some Bezier curve information. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with programming, you can kind of imagine that there'd be some kind of like data structure that holds everything together. Uh, like how does a computer even know how to read what, right? Um, and of course, like the the idea of the digital font file is evolving, evolving like slowly, not too fast, but like it is evolving, right? Like variable fonts, uh, web fonts. Like sometimes it feels like it's the same thing, just wrapped in a different wrapper. But it, it is evolving, right? Like now with AR, VR, like we're starting to have different aspects uh, being encoded in a digital font file. Um, so uh, this meaning will change over time, but I just wanted to get this idea of like, 
the idea that there is a galaxy of information hidden um, in digital representation of letter forms and the possibilities of exploring that space uh, might present itself to me if I just like name it. So I just like, um, it, it's a little bit silly, but I named it the Glyphsian space. And, uh, you know, it's not to say it's not without challenges, right? So um, it just came out, it just came out of this concept to just have a grasp on what I was doing, what I was even trying to explore. But um, at the end of the day, you do have to sit down and make something, right? Like, or as a maker, I feel compelled to make something. Um, and there, I like, you know, like, I won't lie, like, it's, it was very, it had a very, very steep learning um, curve to me, like the way that I learned um, how to teach the computer to draw or how to get the computer to draw what I wanted it to draw. Um, and I, I find uh, uh, the Metafont by Donald Newth very, very inspiring. Um, it's, uh, it's remarkably well, uh, well approachable, let's say, uh, for, you know, like super smart mathematician. Um, and uh, this quote really, really uh, gets me every single time I read it. And in here, uh, Donald says that, machines provide the ultimate test for under understanding an idea because they don't communicate as we do. Uh, we can't really get to the computer and be like, hey, just like draw it like this. And then like, you know, wave a hand in the air. Like we don't have a common language. Um, so like, it's, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes but it also really forces you to examine what you are doing and what you are taking for granted. Um, and so like when we're talking about letters, like there is a variety of different ways that we could teach um, the computer to draw it. And I say teach in a broad way, of course. Um, and uh, because I, I, I also feel like there is like this like uh, collaboration that is going in, right? Like I know the computer can't do certain things. So I try to explain it in a way where it can understand. Um, and some few examples that I might mention is that like the computer thinks differently. And for the result that we want, uh, we need to think about letter forms as something beyond just like the A, the B, or like that diagonal, like the thing with the funny serif, like we need to become proficient in communication. Um, and like this requires that you think about your intentions ahead of time. Um, and it really compels you to think about what you want to do. What is your end vision? Um, for example, like when uh, there is a capital A that is presented. We could explain it as like, it's the letter that is encoded in Unicode 65, right? Like you press like the capital A button on your keyboard and the computer is like 65 and it brings out that letter. Um, but what about like the way that um, you know, like Photoshop's like, like JPEG files work? Um, like those aren't really reading um, what a capital A is. Like when you bring up an image of an A that is like a, like a raster image, the computer just knows that like, okay, like this thing has a resolution of like a hundred by hundred and this should be white, this should be black uh, or whatever color. And we look at it and see like, oh, okay, this is an A, like as a human, we're reading this, but the computer just has no idea. It's just like, okay, like this is like the kind of pixels that I should display. Um, and like, also like, as we have been saying with like a, like a, like a font file, a vector, a Bezier curve, it might be a series of coordinates, right? Um, but this is very interesting because all of these three, um, ways of describing this might describe something that looks exactly the same, but to the computer, they are completely three different ways of thinking about this. And um, I think from this process, we can gain a deeper insight into the Glyphsian space because this means that although the A might look the same to us, in the computer, they represent three distinct um, layers of information or like three different ways of communicating at the very least. Um, and so like, I think it's better that we think about uh, the way that the machine can show letter forms to us as a series of possibilities. Um, as like, for example, like everybody can make spaghetti but there's a lot of different ways to make spaghetti. Not one is right, right? not one is wrong. Um, I can modify it. I, I can get my grandma's recipe and change some things, make them as is. Um, and, and, and I know I'm talking about it in like really abstract ways but like it really isn't that different for a font file. Like you can you can use a font file to make a raster file. You can also use a font file to, to, to I don't know, paint it somewhere, right? Like, like after printing it or something, right? Uh, there's like so many different possibilities. Um, and I think once we start to think about 
um, digital font files as something that is not just uh, a, a random, like not just like this like software thing that you can choose in a drop down menu. Like if we like kind of like take our brains away from the fact that like that is only one of the few things that it can do and it can actually actually do so many more things. I think there is a lot of possibility for us to be creative. Um, and I, I know I've been talking about a lot of theoretical things, and this is also like something that's been marinating my mind for a little bit. So I'll just show you a few sketches that I've been doing in pursuit of exploring this Glyphsian space. So um, the one of the first programming uh, experiences I had was at a residency program called um, SFPC, School for Poetic Computation. Um, and there I was just trying out a lot of different ways that I could perhaps like get uh, you know, like the commonly used Helvetica to have to, to be something more than just a flat black and white letter. So here you can see like I was making um, a word be like some kind of star system that was bigger or smaller, depending on how close it was to the center of the word. And then on the left side, you can see like I just had this outline of an X that I was attaching this like string helicopter to to see like what it would look like if this helicopter thingy was moving in different um areas um, and then like here is a, a sketch where it's just outlines getting eroded over time <laughs> um, so like over time it would get more blobby and blobby and blobby um, and of course I have to give like full credit to Zach Lieberman who was my instructor during this time for open frameworks like um, it really really opened my mind to a lot of different possibilities and so um, I think this was like the gateway exploration for me. Like there was a series of sketches in here, but like I was honestly thinking about letter forms as a way to adapt them from like something physical that I knew, right? Like putting type underwater, like putting um, type like carved in something, like put, you know, um, like, like thinking about them in a physical format. Um, and then so like eventually over time, like I was trying to do things that could only ever be possible in a digital medium. Um, so this is a project that I was doing um, in exploration of machine learning. And so like, um, I always love to <laughs> share uh, resources that I use. So here is Runway ML, um, a very, very a beginner friendly tool that you can use to explore machine learning and then also the MyFonts developer API. Um, I hope it's still live, but this, I don't know, this is about like a year and a half, two years ago or something, but anyhow. Um, so like uh, the MyFonts API lets you uh, pull a lot of uh, images from the MyFonts catalog uh, free of charge. Um, so I was really, really excited about this. Um, I set out to train a GAN, a generative adversarial network. It's a, it's a way of uh, training a machine to, to create something that it has seen before. Um, so I was trying to make like sans, sans serifs because I figured that would be easy because sans serifs seem to have less detail than a serif, for instance. Um, and I assume that there, since there's a lot of sans serifs out there, um, I would be I would be more apt to collect data. So at the end of the day, I downloaded a bunch of different files. Um, so you can see here, I had like one gigabytes worth of images from um, oh sorry from from my fonts. Uh, how many is this? Like fifty thousand, thirty six thousand um, A's. So I had thirty six thousand A's that are all sans serif, um, and. I trained them. <laughs> um, I showed them all to the computer and it went through a bunch of time. Um, and this algorithm was initially used to generate faces like human faces. So you get this like very uncanny um, value of like people turning into A's. Um, like, yeah, um, kind of creepy. But uh, it's not without challenges, of course. Like none of none of the explorations that I'm showing you, like they were all done in one shot. Like I, I had to go through like a bunch of these where like I accidentally turned people into like odd little penguins or something before I like I figured out how to do it. Um, and eventually, like after you train it on an A, like it's easier to train it to do other letters. So you can see like how like um, I made like I added like an S and an H afterwards um, and just so you don't get like motion sickness I'll swap it over to a, um, a flat uh, image and you can see that the uh, the machine is pretty good at recognizing patterns um, and after being shown 36,000 images of A's, S's, and H's like you can kind of reproduce uh, those shapes so you can see that like the H is pretty accurate 
Um, the A and S less so because there's a lot more variation in like an A, um, right? Because there might be a rounded top, there might be a flat top as opposed to like an H, which is a lot more predictable as a shape. Um, so like this was this was one end, but it it's a little bit difficult to control for how much effort it takes to, tr to train something like this. Um, so at the end of the day, like after a while, like I was like, okay, this is good enough. I'm going to go back to uh, trying to bring the real world behaving things um, into the digital realm. So like this is my most recent uh, project. Um, and this lives on as a website, uh, thoughtsonlearning.linyun.com. Um, please don't open it on mobile, like it's still a work in progress. Uh, but if you open it on desktop, um, it sh you should be able to see all these sketches that I'm showing you and interact with them. But yeah, it's not mobile friendly yet. Um, this, this is what happens with like one person projects, right? Like I do something over like a weekend, a few weekends, and then I have to do more. And then um, sometimes I go away or I take a nap and then it doesn't happen. But of course, um, but I digress. So like these were a series of sketches where I was trying to um, explore uh, the idea of digital type uh, being able to transform into different things and transform. Um, I really wanted to explore this idea of algorithms found in nature. So this is the word learning turning into many, many, many different learnings and behaving such as a flock of um, birds or fish would. Like they're coming together, they're repelling each other and the parameters are changing over time. Um, so you can see them uh, moving around by itself. Um, and the fun fact, it kind of avoids the mouse. And here was another exploration where I was trying to take like this like um, tree growing algorithm and trying to see if I could force them to grow into shapes of letters. Um, you can kind of see that like uh, forcing them into shapes like the end doesn't really work because that's not really how it wants to behave, but still fun nevertheless. Um, and here um, is another sketch where I was uh, trying to, this is a visual essay, by the way. So like every every um, sketch has a theme into the, the little snippets that it's attached to. Um, and so like, this is a sketch where there is a central theme of identity and everything that is surrounding it has like this like gravitational attraction slash repelling force. Um, and of course, like if you also wanna do these things yourself, I highly recommend the Nature of Code series. Um, it's a book and also like a YouTube series from Dan Schiffman, um, The Coding Train. Love, love, love Dan Schiffman um, so much. <laughs> so um, here we see, uh, I, I think this is like the pandemic thing. I was kind of like anxious at the time. I was trying to draw things that were expressing my anxiety and also um, kind of like getting soup together sometimes if you got too close, but then um, coming apart again. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, then it gets more wobbly. <laughs> um, so here's another one where um, sometimes I feel like learning things and as you get closer to a, su a subject, you know that there is like things to unlearn from there. Um, And then um, here, here's my last and favorite sketch. Um, so this is a sketch where uh, it has to do with uh, a generative sketch where um, each and every time you run the sketch, the little particles um, or, or the little beings, I like to call them, because um, the, the, the writing is about a individuals coming together and forming learning communities. Um, so like they come together and they form this pattern um, that will never be recreated ever again because it just has to do with the way, uh, the randomized way that they are moving around and um, it, it's almost statistically impossible to get a sketch um, that, it, that will look similar. Um, so that's kind of a fun one. Yeah, um, so like these were a series of explorations into um, let, leaving letter forms um, as letter forms, but also like trying to make them behave such as elements that we would see in nature. Um, yeah, all right, well, this can go on for a while. And if, if you're interested, you can open up the website and let it go for a long time. Um, but I'll, I'll skip to the next one. Um, and, and so it's a never ending journey, um, I think. So I know I wrote about it um, and I'm talking about it now, but I'll likely 
add more, um, think about it more, because it it's really is just a start of a framework, right? Like, I'm not trying to, like, um, argue that there is a certain way to explore this space. Like, I'm just trying to give the idea of exploring this space have um, a name, just so that, like, me as myself am forced to go explore it, um, or I'm motivated. Maybe that's the more positive way of thinking about it. Um, and so like these days I run a studio called Type Space Continuum with my partner, Kevin Ye, and a big part of our studio practice is teaching. Um, and just like I spoke about earlier about uh, how teaching the computer forces you to, um, you know, like re-examine what you thought you knew, like I find that teaching is very similar. Um, so like when I'm teaching my students concepts about generative type, generative typography, uh, and even type design, because I, because I teach that too, um, sometimes with questions I'm kind of, I'm forced to confront with what I took for granted, um, versus like, what is the right way to do it? What is the wrong way to do it? What is a new way to do it? What is an old way to do it? Um, and like the possibilities of, um, of having fresh eyes is I think the challenge in this space. Um, and so I find a lot of joy in uh, interacting with uh, my students all the time and um, uh, just, just in general, like just really marveling at uh, what people are doing in this space just because it's so new. Um, and there really is no right or wrong uh, that you can be doing at this point. Um, so I don't know, like that, <laughs> I find that really, really, really exciting. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to bring the lecture to a close. So thank you very much for listening. I really hope that uh, the concept of Glyphsian space, as silly as that sounds, uh, makes you think about new possibilities in terms of generative, generative typography, digital type, um, and anything that encompasses this space. And I guess if there are any questions, I will now take them with Roy as a moderator. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk more about the ideas that you're presenting here and also like hear more about your background and experience too. I'm super jealous of your educational journey. It sounds like a lot of fun to be able to explore making type in all of these, all of these different ways, like from the more analog techniques that you shared all the way to like studying or you know attending the ITP program at NYU. So I have a couple of questions that maybe I can start with. And if anyone has questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, that way I can kind of just organize them in there. Um, mm -hmm. So one thing that I was really interested in in the Glyphsian Space essay um, is this idea of like being a liminist. I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. pronouncing that correctly. Um, but uh -huh. I think like that, that idea of being like, that being the opposite of like a specialist rather than a generalist was super interesting. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that because I know that's something that students at Art Center are interested in. Like, how do I, like, do I, if I'm interested in code, do I kind of have to focus on that? Mm -hmm. What about the other things that I'm interested in? What's the relationship between code and all these other things I'm interested in, both in typography, but also more broadly in graphic design. So maybe just talking a little bit about that idea would be cool. Yeah, um, so, uh, the liminous concept, um, I, 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 dare I say, coined by um, Alex Singh, um, like it's the concept where it's the opposite of a generalist um, that is different from a specialist, where you are a person who can span several different specialties. So like, if you imagine like silos, I think it's a very poetic way um, in the original excerpt, but like, if you can imagine like silos going up into the sky, if you can become someone that can connect those silos. Um, and if you think about it, like, if you think about a specialist it's probably someone that is just like, has like one very, very, very tall silo, but a liminist might be someone that um, can traverse between the different silos. So like being someone that can connect the dots is I think the, um, is, is I think the simpler way to put it. And I, I think this is a, this is a very good question. Um, I think specialists, especially um, for us in the US are very, well, I guess like schools are very, very, um, encouraging for students to be a specialist in something and often like curriculums 
reflect that. Like, so it, it forces you to, into becoming a motion designer, a brand designer, um, or, you know, so on and so forth, right? Um, and although it might make students more hireable, it also uh, causes this fear of like, if I choose the wrong thing, am I just doomed for the rest of eternity? Um, and, and I have to say, like, I was definitely in that position as a student. Like, I think I was very, like, at the time, I, I think about all these, like, flash classes I took um, that turned out to be completely <laughs> useless. Um, like I was so like, oh no, web, I'm gonna fall behind, motion, I'm gonna fall behind. Um, and it caused me so much anxiety. And I think at the end of the day, like if there is like a formal topic, like, you know, like letters, for instance, as I keep saying, like they're not tied to a program, they're not tied to like a school, they're not tied to a region. Like if there is a topic of interest and you keep going in that direction, I think there's more there rather than like collecting um you know i don't co collecting credentials for like the adobe suite or like whatever software yeah so would you yeah that i mean i i like that point about the the sometimes like the education like the way that the curriculums are structured do you kind of like and and you know incentivize specialization because you can go deeper into like a class like a, an area of graphic design for example if you do take like all of the courses through like one through four, for example, then you've had like, but at the same time, you're also perhaps not exploring everything that there is to explore. Um, when you were work, when you were kind of moving from like calligraphy to woodworking to creative coding and all the things that you were exploring, did that kind of happen organically? Or was that like something intentional that you were like kind of moving through the history of the way that technology and type have been related, like intentionally starting with like, older technology and moving to like code or was that just like coincidental oh i think it was completely coincidental um, i really it's cool, do think, <laughs> i i think i'm i like uh, there's a lot of things i didn't put in the lecture or, or even tell anyone like uh, there's i i took i taking um learning things is like my like fun my hobby in life um and sometimes I fail like like I'm terrible at sourdough um and like you know like these things but like I think uh calligraphy didn't strike me as a letter thing when I started um it sounds really funny but I was like oh I should have better handwriting and then I took a calligraphy class because it was really affordable um and I was like wait this is fun and then like the more I started doing it I was like Oh, actually, now I know how to draw letters better. Um, so it was actually a very, very organic thing. And even the programming thing, I had no intention into connecting it to letters at first. Um, it just happened because I was like typing out a lot of things for work. And I was like, there has to be a better way to do this. And a friend was like, well, if you take like Python classes, it'll be better. And I was like, okay, well, let me, let me go try to do that instead of me typing out like the same things over and over in a Word document. Um, and, and so it happened. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So you don't have a technical background then, right? Like you didn't have like, you didn't study code formally before like uh, school for credit computation in NYU. Yeah, definitely okay, not. Cool. Um, I was, I was, I'm very embarrassed now, but I was definitely one of those people in school that was like, I'm going to make everything by hand. I'm not going to go take a <laughs> web class because I'm never going to need it. Um, and then lo and yeah, behold, totally. like, yeah, years later, it's like, yeah. Very I fun. thought, yeah, I thought there was a, another part of the essay that was like a quote that you had where you're saying, becoming a programmer means that you become proficient in communicating your ideas to the machine. And I feel like that idea of communication is really interesting, especially if you're approaching code from like a non-technical background. Could you talk a little bit more? Because I know a lot of students in the code classes are always interested in like, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of fixated on the idea of maybe not being good at math or having like a technical background. Mm -hmm. And could you, could you, I think the work that you shared is like, has like a really, it, it looks really nice, you know, and it's like really well executed. And it feels like from a, like, just looking at it, like advanced, I guess you could say in terms of like the coding behind of it, behind it. And so I think for, I'm sure students are wondering, like, how could I do something like that if I don't have a non, if I don't have a technical background? So maybe just talking a little bit about how you approached, well, both like how you approach code now, but also maybe the process of learning code, like coming from a non-technical background. Yeah, of course. Thank you. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I, I definitely think that there is 
I think I'm better now because I struggled so much at the start. So like, let me just like preface that. So like, it, it took me a long time. And I also um, took me a while to realize that I just hadn't no like I just didn't know the concept of like how to talk to someone so it's it's really like people say like it's a programming language but it is, really is a language like there is a way that the computer works uh, and if I can kind of like think about it as a person like it's like it's someone that grew up in a completely different space has different kind of parents even if they have parents or whatever like different kind of societal structure um, and you need to find the common ground um, and I think that is difficult to start with but I think once you start getting the hang of it it gets easier and easier and I think the um I think I also get a lot of questions about like what language do I start with like do I do JavaScript do I do Python um and at the end of the day it really is just like if you pick up one language and become good at it you can pick up other things like I think that's also another thing for me that like I'm a little bit programming language agnostic. Um, I use JavaScript, C++, also Python. I just pick up whatever seems to make sense for me at the time. Um, I, maybe that also goes in the concept of liminist, right? I can do pretty good in multiple languages as opposed to being like really proficient with one. Um, yeah, so I think for students, it's really to just like keep on trying because it's not easy. Nobody ever gets it to be easy. You don't need to be good at math. People will help you. Um, I, just keep at it I don't know sorry like it's really just an enthusiastic uh I wish I could just impart the enthusiasm totally well we have a, a, a just a little more time but Roy and Lynn and I were talking earlier um one more thing concept and I think your familiarity with analog letter forms really I think you didn't have to worry about that so much when you started learning your coding because you already had the encoding of the structure of the letter within your, 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 your learning toolkit. And I think that's important for students to understand mm -hmm. the importance of understanding the letter form and analog itself really does inform how well and how quickly you can talk and communicate to the machine about what you want it to see. And um, so I think, you know, that's, it's wonderful. I have to say, I love to see your, your background in such an analog background and it aggressively. And I think that's probably one of the way, reasons you so quickly move through the communication and Roy agrees too with the machine. So we encourage students, at least here at Art Center. Yes, we have great Roy Tatum. who can teach you generative typography and generative design, <laughs> but don't forget if you have access to, you know, letterpress and, you know, earlier technology, you start to understand the formation of the letter form is modular. No matter what the technology is, there's, there's similarity between, you know, between both. But anyway, um, Lynn and Roy, I'm, I wish we had more time, but we don't because everyone has to get to class too. Um, thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both you. so Lynn. much. Thank you for having me. Roy, <laughs> thank you. And thank you everyone for attending. Bye. <laughs>